let's keep going on and talking about our taste receptors. Our sense of taste is also known as our sense of gustation. So if you ever see gustation, that's just a technical term that means taste. And if we look at our taste receptors, we find that we have 4,000 taste receptors or taste buds approximately on the tongue of an average adult human. These taste buds are constantly regenerating throughout our lifetimes because we are constantly destroying our taste buds throughout our lifetime. For example, if you're somebody who likes really, really spicy food and you build up a tolerance for that really, really spicy food, that tolerance physiologically is built up because you've destroyed, you've killed off the taste receptors that respond to those specific sensations. And then if you go weeks or months or even years without eating really spicy food, all of a sudden you can, beco you can become resensitized to that taste and you can lose your ability to eat really spicy food. The five main times, kinds of sensation are sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and unami. Unami is a Japanese word for savory. The classic example of something that is savory is going to be, for lack of a better term, something that's mouth-watering. Um, there is a product that you can make from fermented kelp known as monosodium glutamate, and that is the classic savory addition to most food products. A lot of what we sense with taste is also going to be perceived as a sense of smell. And this is one of the primary reasons why when you have a stuffy nose or you have a cold, it's really hard for you to taste food. It's also worth emphasizing that we have taste buds located on our hard palate, our soft palate, the lining of our cheeks, and our oropharynx, or the back of our throat. So just because we have lots of taste buds on our tongue doesn't mean that we don't have taste buds in other parts of our oral cavity. This is one of the primary reasons why if you're ever with a coffee snob or somebody who really likes their wine and they're really particular in how they taste their wine, a lot of times they will slurp their expensive beverage so that they can activate all of their sensory taste buds by coating the entire inside of their oral cavity with the beverage. So as we look at these taste receptors, they will be located on papillae of our tongues, and there are different kinds of papillae. A papillae is a generic term for a fleshy extension or a fleshy growth. And if you've ever taken the time to stick out your tongue in the mirror in the bathroom and go, eh, and look at the back of your tongue, you've probably noticed that you have lots of weird little growths on the back of your tongue. That's one kind of papillae. And then you have different growths on the tips of your tongue, different papillae on the middle of your tongue, so on and so forth. Those papillae are small extensions, and on each papillae, we have multiple little bumps. Each bump is called a taste bud. And then inside each taste bud, there's an indentation known as the taste pore. In order to taste something, you need to take the chemical that you're tasting and dissolve it in your saliva. And from your saliva, that chemical then works its way into the taste pore. This is one of the reasons for aftertaste. Even after you swallow a food product, many of us can still taste it in our mouths because small amounts of the saliva we dissolved our food in are still, will still be trapped inside of that taste pore, stimulating our sensory receptors. This is also the basis behind pairing the proper wine with the proper cheese or having the correct kind of beer with the correct kind of meat. Certain beverages are capable of dissolving different molecules from the food to give you a different sense of taste from that food, particularly if you pair your food product with an alcoholic beverage because alcoholic beverages have that ethanol group with a hydrophobic, hydrophilic region on it. Well, let's move on and talk about our sense of smell. Just like our sense of taste, our sense of smell is going to rely on taking small particles 
of whatever it is we're smelling and bringing them into our body. So if you ever smell a flower, you are quite literally taking molecules from that flower, bits and pieces of the flower, and breathing them into your nose. Those little bits and pieces of the flower will deserve, dissolve into the upper lining of your nasal cavity. The upper lining of your nasal cavity is known as the olfactory mucosa. And within that mucosa, if we can dissolve those molecules in the mucous membrane of our olfactory cavity, we can stimulate small sensory hairs. These sensory hairs are currently hypothesized to be related directly to vibrational frequencies or vibrational harmonics of the molecules. Um, and if the molecule vibrates with a specific frequency, it will stimulate a specific olfactory hair and be transmitted as a specific kind of smell. Um, some research that's been done that backs up this theory has looked at very different shaped molecules that have almost identical smells and coincidentally have almost identical vibrational frequencies. After these dendrites are stimulated by the vibrational frequency of the odor molecule, the action potential is transmitted to the cell body of our olfactory cell and then passed on to the axon and eventually to the olfactory bulb, which connects to our olfactory tract, or cranial nerve number one, the olfactory nerve. Now, there are a bunch of little perforations in the cranial cavity that the axons of our olfactory neurons need to travel through. Those little perforations are in a structure known as the cribriform plate, and those are located on a bone called the ethmoid bone which is one of the bones we'll talk about in more detail if you ever take human anatomy. So, class, concept check. Do specific parts of the tongue only perceive specific tastes? For example, do we only have the ability to taste something sweet with the tip of our tongue and only taste something bitter with the side of our tongue and only something savory with the bottom of our tongue? Or can we taste all tastes with all parts of our tongue? Yeah, that's, that was the consensus for the class. The, and that is correct. We can have all sensory sensations or all sense of taste on our tongue at any given point in our tongue. Um, I put this in here to address a specific misconception. Many students erroneously believe that you can only taste sweet taste with a specific part of your tongue or sour taste with a specific part of your tongue, so on and so forth. It is true that there's some localization or varying concentrations of sweet sensory receptors or sour sensory receptors, but they are still going to be located in all parts of the tongue and across the oral cavity as a whole. Let's talk about our eyeballs. So if we look at the eyeball, our eyeball can be broken up into several different layers. We have our sclera and our choroid and our retina. This is sometimes known as the fibrous tunic. If we look at our sclera, I want you to think of the sclera as the white of your eye. I hope you got that question right on your lab exam. Now, if we look at our sclera, not only is it white, but also it has many fibers in it. It has a high concentration of collagen fibers. There's one specific part, though, that doesn't have those white fibrous fibers, and that is the cornea. The cornea is transparent or in other words, it's translucent, and it's located on the anterior part of our eye. That's what light will travel through initially. Our cornea is exposed to the external environment, just like the white of our eyes, the sclera is, and it needs to be able to resist impact and resist abrasion. When my human anatomy students do eyeball dissections, they are almost always surprised with how resistant the sclera and the choroid are to dissection and impact. 
And even with using brand new s surgical scalpel blades, they still have to stab it really hard in order to penetrate it and start opening up the eyeball. Deep to the sclera, we have the choroid. And I'm going to skip to the, this slide right here. So we have the sclera on the outside. That's our white fibrous layer. And then deep to it, we have the choroid. Our choroid is a dark pigmented layer that contains most of the blood vessels. In addition to containing most of the blood vessels of the eye, the choroid serves to keep extra light from entering the eye. The only light that we want entering the eyeball, we want coming in through the anterior of the eye. If we had light coming in through the side of the eye and avoiding the lens and the cornea, that light would be unfocused and we would not have the ability to focus on individual objects. Our sense of vision would be dramatically reduced, primarily to the point of being able to see light and dark, but not actually seeing individual shapes. And then finally, we have the retina. The retina is the inner layer of the eye. Our retina contains our photoreceptors. And this retina lines the majority of the posterior compartment. Most of the retina will be covered in photoreceptors, the rods and cones we use to see with. There's a small portion, though, of the retina that does not have photoreceptors on it, and that is right here. This small portion of the retina is known as the blind spot, and it's covered in blood vessels and axons of neurons. And because there's such a high concentration of blood vessels and neuronal axons, we don't have any photoreceptors there, and we don't have the ability to see anything. For most of us, our blind spot is going to be located slightly to our left and our right. And if you go to Google Images and type blind spot test, you can find a bunch of them on the internet. And they're kind of fun to try out. We also have in our eye two compartments. There's one in front and one in back. We have the anterior compartment and the posterior compartment. Our anterior compartment is the space between the cornea and the lens of the eye. And it's going to be filled with a very watery fluid known as the aqueous humor, or quite literally, the watery liquid. <laughs> and then we have the posterior compartment. Our posterior compartment is going to be the large area between the retina and the lens. And this area is going to carry a very, contain a very viscous fluid known as the vitreous humor. So our posterior compartment starts right here and goes all the way back to the retina. Let's go ahead and erase this to make it a little bit clearer for us. So here's the start of the posterior compartment. And this whole compartment will be filled with vitreous humor, or the jelly-like liquid, also known as eyeball goop. It has a consistency of um, coagulated blood, or um, mucus, for lack of a better comparison. And then from the anterior of the lens to the posterior of the cornea, we have the anterior cavity, or anterior compartment, as it's also known as. And that's going to be filled with a fluid that's very watery in consistency. One of the primary reasons that we have these different fluids in our eyes is because when light goes through different substances, light will oftentimes bend. It's known as refraction of light. You've probably noticed this if you've ever taken a sippy straw and shoved it in a glass of water. And the sippy straw seems to magically be moved off to the side once it meet, reaches into the water. Or if you look at fish swimming in a stream and you try to poke them with a stick, many times you miss because the fish, in all reality, the, is at a different location from where you see it because light bends when it goes from water to air. We want to bend the light that's going through our eyes and have that light come in contact with the fovea centralis, which is the focal point in the back of our eyes. 
Actually, I should be drawing it like that with the apex of the triangle at the tip of the fovea centralis. There we go. We want light going through the lens of our eyes and going specifically to that fovea centralis. Now, we will have some light that bounces to other regions in our eye. This light that is unfocused is light that gives us our sense of peripheral vision. But when you specifically focus on something, you are aiming your eyeball at it in such a way and you're shaping the lens of your eyeball in such a way that the light is focusing directly on the fovea centralis. The fovea centralis is part of the retina. Let's look, go back to our sclera. That sclera, which is part of our eye, is the white of the eye, and it contains the cornea and will also have a pupil in it as well. If we look at the cornea, it's that transparent layer on the anterior portion of the eye, and it marks the anterior portion of the anterior compartment. It's the very front of the eye, and it's that clear membrane. And then as light travels through the cornea and through the aqueous humor in that anterior compartment, light will move through the pupil. Our pupil is a hole that lets light into our eyeball, and it's going to change in size. When we're in dark environments, the pupil becomes larger and lets more light into our eyeballs. And when we're exposed to bright lights, the pupil constricts or contracts and lets less light into our eyeballs. The structure in our eye that can contract and relax to change the size of the pupil is known as the iris or the colored part of our eye. So if you have green eyes, you have a green iris. If you have blue eyes, you have a blue iris. And as we contract and relax the iris, we change the size of the opening. We change the size of our pupil. If we look at the choroid, that middle layer of the eye, in addition to having the iris, it's also going to have a structure known as the ciliary body. The ciliary body is made of smooth muscles and it's going to serve to directly control our focusing of the lens. So our choroid body will have small little ligaments going from the smooth muscles that make it up to the lens of our eye and it will change the shape of the lens, allowing us to focus on near and far objects. That lens of our eye is kind of squishy. It has some plasticity to it that allows us to see things that are close up and to see things that are far away as we focus light. So let's go back to the diagram of our eye. As we go back to this diagram, we have the pupil, and this person has blue eyes because they have a blue pupil, and the pupil goes around, excuse me, the iris goes around the pupil, so this person has a blue iris, and the iris can open up or dilate the pupil, or it can constrict the pupil and allow light to go through the lens. The lens of our eye is right here. I'm outlining it in red. And there's many small ligaments called suspensory ligaments that connect the lens to a ring of smooth muscle that's behind or posterior to the iris. That ring of smooth muscle that's posterior, it's a separate ring, is known as the ciliary body. As we look at this lens, it's very important that it's transparent. So our lens is going to be avascular. What does avascular mean? When we talk about the cardiovascular system, what are we talking about? Blood vessels. So vascular means blood vessel. Avascular is without blood vessels. So our lens does not have any blood vessels in it. And that's a good thing because blood vessels would block the light that's trying to go through the lens. Our lens also has a concave structure in the center. Our lens 
and I'm overemphasizing this right now, has a concave or an indentation to it to help us focus light. Now, if we look at our lens, we can have some visual accommodation occur at the lens of our eyes. When I say visual accommodation, I mean that the lens changes shape. As we contract and relax the ciliary muscles, we cause the lens to flatten out or to bulge more. And by changing its shape, we can change on wh whether or not we focus on objects that are far from our eyes or close from our eyes. Objects that are very far away from us, think of on the horizon, are generally speaking going to have rays of light that are all traveling parallel to each other. But objects that are very close to us will have rays of light, because the object is closer, that are traveling different directions from each other. So to accommodate rays of light that are traveling in different directions, our lens will change shape to bend the rays of light that are moving in different directions and refocus those rays of light on the fovea centralis within our retina. Any questions about that? Okie dokie. A downside of getting older is that our lens becomes more rigid. It loses plasticity or elasticity. And there are some things you can do to combat this. There are actually exercises for your ciliary body, exercises for the lens of your eyes. And they're pretty simple. And they involve taking your finger, putting it right in front of your face, and focusing on your finger as close as possible, up until the point that you start going cross-eyed, and then focusing on the horizon, and then focusing back on your finger and the horizon. And when you do that repeatedly, you are taking your lens of your eye and you're squishing it and you're relaxing it. Squishing it and relaxing it. So, or I should say, you're pulling it apart and then relaxing it. In other words, by causing that lens to flex and contract more, you help it to maintain its elasticity for a longer period of time. Oh, I guess I was getting ahead of myself when I was drawing the diagram. So for example, if we look at a distant object, that distant object is so far away that the rays of light that get to your eye are all traveling parallel, whereas that nearby object will have rays of light radiating in different directions. So depending on how far away the object is, we need to change the shape of our eye. Let's look at the third layer, the retina which contains our rods and our cones, our photoreceptors. Now, when it, I, you think of cones, I want you to think of color vision. Color for cone, C for color, C for cone. These cones in our eyes let us respond to different colors. And that's great because there's lots of information that can be contained in red or blue or green or yellow, the different colors we can see. The downside of the cones is that we need a bright light to see in color. And then we also have rods. I, when we think of our rods, I want you to think of our sense of night vision. Rods do not allow us to see in color, but they do allow us to see in the dark. They are very sensitive to low light environments. Now, in our retina, there's an area known as the fovea centralis that I mentioned before that we try to focus light on. This fovea centralis has a very high concentration of cones. It is exclusively cones and does not have any rods in it. So if we focus light on the fovea centralis, and that fovea centralis does not have any rods present in it. Would we have the ability to see low light environment, see in a low light environment with the fovea centralis? If it does not have any rods. That's correct, Angel. We would not. Since the fovea centralis does not have any rods, we cannot see anything with the fovea centralis in a low light environment. In other words, if you're looking at the stars at night 
And you notice that when, for the dim stars, the very faint stars, you can look at the, directly at them and they disappear. But then you can look off to the side a little bit and then they reappear in your peripheral vision. The reason that happens is because you have rods in the periphery of your retina, but in the part of the retina you focus on, the fovea centralis, you do not have any rods. As we move information across our retina from the rods and cones, the axons of the neurons are going to travel across the surface of the retina. And the blood vessels that supply nutrients to those rods and cones and neurons also travel across the surface of the retina. And they all are going to enter and exit the eye through the optic nerve. And because of all those blood vessels and axons, right in front of the optic nerve, anterior to that optic nerve on the retina, we do not have any photoreceptors at all. We have a blind spot. So here we can see lots of blood vessels going in and out of the eye over the top of the retina. That's our blind spot, and it's directly opposite or anterior to the optic nerve. The outer layer of our eye is the white of our eye, and it's the sclera. And then we can see from this photomicrograph, the sclera is quite white in coloration. And then the choroid, that dark pigmented layer, is a black layer that keeps extra light from getting into our eyes. And then we'll have rods and cones in the retina. And then after the rods and cones, we are going to have two layers of neurons covering them up. And this is a quirk of human eyes. Not all organisms have their layers of the retina organized in this fashion. It's actually a much more logical arrangement to have the rods and cones directly against the vitreous humor. So that when a ray of light goes into the eye, that ray of light hits the rods and cones first. We as human beings, though, keep our rods and cones buried three to four layers of cells deep in the retina. So as light is traveling into our eye, that light needs to travel through the ganglion, past all the axons, past the ganglion cell layer, past the bipolar cell layer to get to the rods and cones. And then that light stimulates the rods and cones. And then the action potential, the nervous signal, travels back up this direction, through the bipolar cell layer to the ganglion cell layer, and then down all the axons that coat the surface of the retina. So this quirk of human biology isn't necessarily the most efficient way. There are other organisms that will have the retinas be impacted by the light, or the rods and cones impacted by the rays of light. First, because the rods and cones are located as the first layer. Now, as I look at the, or as we look at the rods and the cones, their ability to receive, perceive color or perceive low light is going to mean that they have some different proteins and some different chemicals inside of them. The visual pigment associated with a rod and the, its ability to see in a low light environment is called rhodopsin. When rhodopsin is hit by a photon of light, rhodopsin changes shape. And it's quite literally will bend in on itself and fold in half. And when rhodopsin folds in half, it initiates a series of chemical reactions that we perceive as light. And then to get rhodopsin to go back to its original shape, we need to use up a little bit of ATP to cause rhodopsin to go back to its starting point. Practically speaking, it takes time for rhodopsin to go back to its starting point. And if we are exposed to a really bright light, all of our rhodopsin molecules can fold in on themselves, and then they slowly start to unfold. You probably noticed this if you've ever driven a car at night and somebody's had their high beams hit you in the eye and you're temporarily blinded and you have a really hard time seeing it at night, when you're hit in the eye with that really bright light, that unexpectedly bright light, you activate most of your rhodopsins immediately and then you slowly need to deactivate them, use burning through ATP.
If you're exposed to a very bright light for a long period of time, you can even burn through the ATP supply within the rod cell itself. And then you need to wait to regenerate the ATP so that you can regenerate the rhodopsin to its starting point, and that takes even longer. Vitamin A is a, a vitamin that's quite important to maintaining the production of rhodopsin. Practically speaking, if you want to see well at night, many people use red flashlights. The reason you use a red flashlight is the red light from that red flashlight stimulates the cones of your eyes, and then you can turn the red flashlight off and still have your rods fully charged and ready to go so you can still see in that low light environment. If we look at those cones, which are located in the fovea centralis, which is the center of the macula lutea, we have three different kinds of cones. Those three cones correspond to the primary colors of light. Light primary colors are slightly different from pigment primary colors. So think back to your grade school art classes where you had red paint, yellow paint, and blue paint, and you would experiment by mixing them together to make different colors. When we mix light together to make different colors, the primary colors are not red, green, and, or red, blue, and yellow. The primary colors are red, green, and blue. So instead of yellow, we replace yellow with green and to get the primary colors for light. If you ever had some drops of water hit a computer screen or maybe a television monitor or a cell phone screen, those drops of water oftentimes will magnify the pixels and you can see the individual red, blue, and green components of the individual pixels that make up the screens on your electronic devices. Here are some rods and cones. This is a transmission electron micrograph. And we can see that the cones, quite literally, have a cone shape to them. And the rods have more of a rod shape to them, hence their names. Both the rods and the cones are going to contain proteins that change shape in response to a photon of light. So here we can see rhodopsin. And when rhodopsin is hit by a beam of light, that rhodopsin changes shape. And by changing its structure, it changes its function and can initiate a series of secondary chemical reactions inside of the cell that depolarize the cell and cause it to transmit that electrical signal or action potential. Here is a summary table talking about the structures of the eye that we've covered and the functions of the eye. Again, this is, these tables are great fodder for those of you who like making flashcards. Let's talk about some things that can go wrong with our eyes. You can be colorblind. Individuals that are colorblind can be lacking a red cone receptor or a green cone receptor or a blue cone receptor. The most common kinds of color blindness are usually going to be red-green color blindness. Red-green color blindness is a mutation that's carried on the X chromosome. And since males only have one copy of the X chromosome, they are more likely to inherit this disease because they don't have a backup copy of the X chromosome like females do. Another common disease of the eye is a cataract. A cataract is when the lens of the eye becomes cloudy and opaque. And this is typically going to be associated with high ultraviolet light exposure. Individuals that spend lots of time having bright light shine in their eyes are going to be bright sunlight, I should say, shining light in their eyes, are more likely to develop a cataract. So individuals that live in the Arctic and Antarctic or in desert environments are more likely to have cataracts developed. And then there's also glaucoma. Glaucoma is when there's excessive fluid built up in the eye. In particular, there's excessive production of the aqueous humor. And if there's too much aqueous humor building up, that causes the cornea of the eye to start to stretch out and be misshapen. And if the cornea is misshapen, rays of light start to bend in weird directions. And people with glaucoma have a hard time visualizing what they look at or focusing on what they look at. Ashley. Astigmatism work in the eye. Astigmatism is when the lens is uneven, the curvature of the lens is uneven. And if that, that curvature of the lens is uneven, 
part of what somebody looks at can be in focus and part of it can be out of focus at the same time. Individuals that have astigmatism don't have the ability to focus completely on an object at the same time because of the abnormal curvature of the lens. To correct for astigmatism, individuals need to wear a gla glasses or contact lenses that have abnormal curvature. We also have nearsightedness, also known as myopia. And then we have farsightedness, farsightedness, known as hyperopia. This individual that is nearsighted has an eyeball that's stretched out too far. Their eyeball is too long. And they have a tough time focusing light on the back of their eye because that light needs to move too far. The focal point is too far away from the lens. Individuals that are farsighted have the opposite problem. Their eyeball is too short, and because it's too short, it's difficult for them to tighten down on the light and focus it on the fovea centralis. So here's a typical eye where we have light focusing. On our, oh, excuse me, here is somebody who is nearsighted, and light, the focal point of the light, is before the retina. A normal eyeball would stop right there. But somebody who's nearsighted has an eyeball that's stretched out and the focal point of the light is before the fovea centralis or anterior to the fovea centralis. So to correct for that, they need to wear a glasses with a concave lens and then the focal point is adjusted for. Individuals that are nearsighted have eyeballs that are too short, and a normal eyeball would be longer, and when they try to focus on light, the focal point of that light is posterior to the fovea centralis. So they are correct for that, they wear a convex lens. And then someone that has astigmatism has a weird bulging or curvature to either their lens or their cornea, and they account for the astigmatism, they have to wear an irregularly curved lens to account for the irregular curvature of their eye. So, guys, gals, I have a concept check question for you. When you look at something in the dark, why is it that you often see it in your peripheral vision, but not when you look directly at it? That is exactly right, Austin. You can often see objects in the dark in your peripheral vision because you have rods in the periphery of your retina, but in the fovea centralis and macula lutea, you do not have any rods. You only have the ability to see bright light in color. It does.